Are you like super mad because you've been making payments in your student loans and the interest just goes up and up and you feel like you're never going to make a dent? So let's just talk a little bit about student loan interest and see if you're paying way too much of it because a lot of people really are. Here's why I know this. It's because people don't understand how it works. I know because I've advised thousands of student loan borrowers with hundreds of millions of student loan debt and one of the most common things people say is, your spreadsheet is wrong. The interest doesn't grow like that. I should owe way more than that after 20 years. So that was a bad impression. But the reason why people are freaking out is because of something called compounding. So think about this. If you have an investment and it's growing at 7%, then how long does it take for your money to double? So there's this rule called the rule of 72. And basically what you do is you take 72 divided by the interest rate and that gives you the number of years that it's going to take for your investment to double. So 72 divided by seven is about 10. So that means that an investment getting a 7% return might double in about 10 years. So the problem is people take that basic level of knowledge and then they try to apply it to student loans, which are a lot more complicated than you might think. So for example, if you have 100,000 of student loans at a 7%, you might assume that if you're paying $0 a month for the entire 20 year period that a lot of loan forgiveness programs last for, that at you know the end of 10 years, 100,000 will have grown into 200,000. And then you might assume that after another 10 years, 200,000 will have grown into 400,000, which is a really big freaking number compared to what you initially borrowed, right? But here's where the first concept comes in that you need to know about student loan interest. The first, is that student loan interest should accrue, not compound. What is student loan interest accrual? It means student loan interest grows linearly instead of exponentially. That's my best uh, impression there of an exponential graph. So what does that mean? Student loan interest accrual kind of works like this. You've got that $100,000 of student loans, right? And let's say that you owe it to the federal government. So let's say you're making a very low income your payments could legitimately be $0 a month and you would be in good standing on an income-driven repayment program, let's say if you made $20,000 per year. Obviously, we hope you don't make that, but if you are making that, this is really great for illustration purposes because it's a lot easier to calculate all this interest math when the payments are basically nothing. So what would happen is, is if you are paying nothing on your student loans and you got $100,000 but you're on an income-driven plan, that means that you're getting interest accrual, which means simple interest, right? And how does that work? So if you have a 7% interest rate, that means a $7,000 interest charge on $100,000. And that $7,000 interest charge is going to be added up each year. So 7,000 year one, 7,000 year two, 7,000 year three, et cetera. Now over 20 years, the way you calculate your final balance is not like that compounding rule of 72 that I discussed earlier. What you do instead is you take the initial balance, 100,000, plus about 7,000 a year of interest times 20. So that's 140,000 of interest charges over 20 years, right? Plus $100,000 of principal. So if you take the combination of those two, that's $240,000. Now, I don't know about you, but what's better? 240,000 or 400,000? Pretty clear you'd rather have a $240,000 balance than a $400,000 balance, right? And that is the power of simple interest instead of compounded interest. And that is why student loans are not like other kinds of debt. They're not credit cards that compound on you. It's debt that at worst should be growing at a rate of interest that's simple interest instead of compounded. Now, if we think about what is the rate of inflation, maybe it's around 3%, let's say. And using that rule of 72, you know, you might get a figure, say, around, you know, 72 divided by 3, let's just say 20-something. So 20-something years, that would be how long it would for your money to double. So what that tells you is the rate of simple interest basically is kind of similar to inflation. And that's a groundbreaking idea. In terms of how student loan interest works, it's really comforting to know that even if you're paying as little as $0 a month, your student loan balance should really never be growing faster than the rate of inflation. 
And that means in real terms, your interest is really not growing at all. It certainly feels like it is, but it's not an actuality. So that's the first and probably most important concept about student loan interest, is that it accrues instead of compounds. Now let's look at the second concept, which is called capitalization. So you might look at your student loan interest balance sometime if you go to nslds.ed.gov, which is this website where you can look at federal student loans. And if you log in, you're going to see a summary column that shows total principal and then total interest. And that total interest amount will be, let's say, it's some large sum, right? And to use that prior example, let's say that you've been paying almost nothing on your loans for a while, and you have 100,000 of principal, and well, let's say you have maybe 20 or 30,000 of interest uh, that has already gotten added on. And so, well, what happened is, is those two columns are actually separate, which means that that $7,000 per year interest charge is only being generated from that original principal and not all those additional interest costs. So that's, again, how that works is that you have accrual and it doesn't compound, right? But here's the problem with capitalization. Capitalization means all of your interest goes into your principal balance and your new interest charge is based off of what the new principal balance is. So to use an example, let's say you have gone years with paying you know, the minimum and your loan balance has you know, gotten a lot larger because you have a ton of accrued interest going on. In that case, if you do any one of the following things, that interest gets added to your principal. A couple examples of what you would do that would cause this mess up would be going into forbearance, going into some kind of deferment, going into a change of income-driven repayment programs. Those are the most common reasons why people basically get themselves in a situation where they're no longer eligible for you know this this accrued interest growth that happens, and so then that interest gets added to their principal balance, which is kind of like a one-time compounding. So if that has happened to you, good news, you can keep things going where it's not going to you know happen again. You can make it a one-time thing. But what we see are what I would call habitual forbearance users, people that have been in and out of forbearance and using different kinds of income-driven repayment programs and switching plans and just not having a clear strategy. And what happens when you do that is that compounds that interest costs. So remember I said that you could have owed 240 k or 400 k in 20 years if you're pursuing like an income-driven repayment program? So those people that are using all kinds of forbearance and switching plans and capitalizing their interest costs are going to owe more close to that 400k balance. And that's a really lousy thing. And you can avoid it by simply being aware that forbearance and changing different income-driven repayment programs, and another reason I forgot to mention was failing to certify your income on time. If you forget to certify your income on time, that kind of counts as you know not fulfilling the requirements of income-driven repayment, and then your interest can capitalize. So you really want to try to avoid interest capitalization so that you can have student loan interest accrual. The third feature of how student loan interest works that I want to talk about is that you can get subsidies on the right repayment plan. So there's something called the revised pay-as-you-earn repayment plan. And this payment plan allows you to get a subsidy of all interest that your required payment does not cover. So here's how this translates. Remember the earlier example of $100,000 of student loans at 7%. If your required payment is $0 a month based off of your prior year tax return, then all of the interest is unpaid by your required payment, which means that the subsidy would be 50% of all of your interest. So instead of $7,000 of interest that would add on to your accrued interest balance, you would get half of that, $3,500, which is really an awesome subsidy. Now, how does that subsidy decline or go away? When your required payment is not zero, then some of that's going to be applied to the interest balance. So let's say that your required payment was $1,000 per year on your loans, and that $7,000 interest cost would have that 1,000 applied first to that. So the remaining interest cost would be about $7,000. Sorry, $6,000, 7,000 minus 1,000, right? Oops, can't do math. $6,000 divided by two is $3,000. So the interest subsidy is smaller because you're actually making a little bit more of an income now, but it's still significant. And because of that, the interest rate that's stated on the page is not the same thing as the actual interest that you're actually getting charged. 
And that's a really important concept because everybody doesn't understand that there's ways to subsidize federal student loan interest in a lot of cases that reduces the interest cost below what it actually looks like. Finally, there are different kinds of loans that give you different kinds of subsidies over and above being on the right repayment plan for subsidies. So what I mean by this is there are such things as Perkins loans, Stafford subsidized loans, and health professions loans from the Department of, Edu Department of Health, actually. So what, what are these loans? How do they work? Basically, while you're in school, all of those loans do not accrue interest. For people taking out unsubsidized or grad plus or parent plus loans, those loans will accrue interest while you're in school or your child's in school if you're taking a parent plus loan. And that means your balance is going to grow significantly while you're in school. And that's an important thing to realize when you're trying to figure out how the interest works. Because you obviously want to take out a lot of loans that have interest protections versus ones that don't, all things equal. Now, while you're enrolled in this, you know, program, the interest doesn't accrue on these subsidized loans, but when you graduate, it starts to accrue once your grace period is over, right? And so actually on some subsidized loans, if you're on an income-driven repayment program, then you can actually get 100% of the interest subsidized for the first three years. So that's something that people will often not tell you. And also sometimes people get that confused with the subsidy that exists for all loans on the revised pay-as-you-earn program. So that's 100% subsidy. You certainly want to take advantage of that. Now for Department of Health loans, those loans usually get you know, a grace period of several months to a year and you get that no interest of growth during that time. But after that, the interest does start to accumulate. And so we usually suggest that people with health professions loans go ahead and consolidate those with the federal government uh, if they're not actually just paying them off in full through refinancing. And Perkins loans, I've got some good news, are pretty much going away. Sorry, maybe that's not good news if you're depending on those, but Perkins loans are a relatively minor part of the total picture in terms of how student loan interest works because it's a program that's at least been getting phased out for the past several years. So to recap, four big things to know. Student loan interest accrues, avoid student loan interest capitalization, use the right repayment program for getting interest subsidies like revised pay as you earn, and take out the right kind of loans so that you get interest subsidies and lack of interest growth while you're a student, or at least be aware of what exactly you're taking out in the first place. And if you know all these things, then you don't have to freak out about your student loan interest because you know exactly what it's gonna be, and you know what's going on, and you're not in the dark about why your balance grew, and you're a little bit more at peace because the balance is going to grow slower than you thought it was going to grow. So any comments or questions about student loan interest, drop it down in the comment section. We're here to help. Thanks for watching. I'm Travis with Student Loan Planner.